Okay, welcome to the online uh, causal inference seminar. And so to mix things up a little bit, uh, we decided to have a couple of uh, meetings where instead of having a seminar, we're going to interview people who've done interesting work on, uh, on causal inference. Uh, and for this for first interview, we're thrilled to have uh, Esther Duflo uh, join us and um, answer some questions. So, um, Esther is the Abdul Latif Jamil Professor of Poverty Elevation and um, Development Economics in uh, the Department of Economics at MIT. She's been there since uh, graduate school the, after doing her undergraduate degree in, uh, in Paris. Esther has received uh, most of the prizes and honors uh, available to economists. Uh, she won the Clark Medal for the best economist under 40 in uh, 2010. And she won a MacArthur Award in 2009. And last year she won the Nobel Prize in Economics uh, together with uh, the Abhijit Banerjee and, uh, and Michael Kramer for her work using you know, experiments uh, in development uh, economics. We're thrilled to, uh, to have es Esther here today. And so let me uh, start. This, um, um, with your work early on, uh, so when you when you were in graduate school, doing experiments in uh, in development economics or in economics in general was very rare. And in your thesis, you also didn't do uh, experiments. You kind of worked more in the natural experiments literature that people like Josh Angrist uh, were working in at the time. Uh, and so you looked at the effect of uh, schools in, in Indonesia using the fact that there was a big expansion of, uh, of schools uh, there at the time. At what point kind of did you start to think that even though kind of a lot of the natural experiments uh, research was very convincing, at what point did you realize that, that maybe actually you could do experiments and do them possibly at scale? And uh, how, how did you get started uh, there? First of all, thank you very much for, for having me. It's uh, really, uh, a great pleasure to be here and I'm very glad to have uh, that you have this collaboration with statisticians this is a little bit starting also at MIT uh, I think it's very nice when economists don't talk just to each other uh, and we you know through collaborations with CS people going to statistics and econometricians going to statistics have met uh, more and more of your uh, collaborators and it's been a huge uh, pleasure um, so I started, I actually first heard of the idea that you could do randomized control trials in development when I was in, uh, when I was in graduate school, when uh, in, in class actually, uh, Michael Kramer and Abhijit Banerjee were just starting a running uh, trial. And in fact, uh, in my, I took development two the same class in development two years in a row for, for some reason. I think not for an accidental reason because I was hooked the first time around and I thought, let me see if I can get even more out of those two. And um, uh, so I saw the first paper of Michael sort of develop uh, in this time. And it was an experiment on uh, a textbooks in primary school in Kenya. And uh, it was uh, uh, completely amazing because you could see like all of the errors being made and being corrected as we went. And he, they, he started with 14 schools and he had uh, randomized seven into treatment and seven into control, treatment being textbooks. And he was really convinced that there would be a huge effect of giving textbooks. And that's why he had picked that example because he thought he would, he would need to start to convince the NGO to work with him with something like really like uncontroversial. And of course, if you give textbooks to kids in Kenya, it has to be making a difference. And he ran this first experiment in this 14th school and he didn't find any effect. And then he thought, well, so he taught us that and he thought, well, maybe it's because uh, really with seven schools, even though I have a lot of kids, there is clustering, so I don't have enough observations, so I need to do this on a larger scale. So the next year he ran the experiment on a larger scale with 100 schools and still he doesn't find any effect. So then he said, well, maybe it's because the measurement is not good because I'm using the official test and they are so hard for the kids that they're getting zeros. So there is absolutely no discrimination at the, 
at the level at which they, they, they could possibly be making progress. So let me run my own test and he work with a psychologist, develop his own test, rerun the experiment with his own test, and still didn't find anything. And I thought this was so amazing. <laughs> uh, that you, uh, you know, you, 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 first of all, it's, it's hard. There are many things to think about. It seems obvious and com common sense, and yet there are so many decisions that you need to, to, to think about and expose. They look obvious, and now we wouldn't do this. But uh, uh, this really is by, you know, someone as smart as him doing it that we figure out <laughs> what should not be done. And also that the result was really not what he was expecting at all. And uh, I think for me, if he had found large effect of textbooks, I probably would have not really noticed. Somehow, I think it would, might not have registered. But the fact that the results were so different from what he expected, and they stayed different after he corrected all of the possible mistakes, uh, made me think, wow, this is really like, I was so suspicious, still am, of most intuition in economics that I thought that's, you know, that's the only way to really get rid of, of the intuition. So that's you know, what I was learning on the, in grad school, but I didn't, I thought it would be a bit difficult to do. And in the meantime, I was a student of Josh and I was alarmed and I was taught uh, into uh, sort of the whole language of uh, um, causal inference and uh, how to use the randomized uh, uh, evaluation as an analogy for what we do. And so all of my papers in my thesis go start with the ideal experiment to estimate the effect of blah on blah would be to do a randomized control trial. And then when I, got, when I got a job and I felt I have some years in front of me and I can now access some money, I was like, you know, I should do the ideal experiment. There's no reason to try and get close to it. If that's the ideal experiment, then that's what I'm going to do. And so that's what I started doing, like the moment I got my PhD. That's, that's very interesting because you could have imagined that those early difficulties would have made people just go away from that thing. Because in some sense, that sounds very much like what I would have expected, that the experiments were just really difficult to do and it was hard to implement. Um, but it's interesting that that actually spurred you guys on. Then. Second question, kind of very early on, you guys started building an infrastructure so that lots more people could do experiments. And again, that was something very unusual. Uh, typically, economists kind of work in small groups and just work on their own papers. But you guys built this whole infrastructure with uh, J-PAL that you and Abhijit and uh, Sandal uh, founded that in the end ended up doing hundreds and hundreds of, of experiments. Uh, what was the the motivation for that and there must have been some pushback for doing that because it was such an unusual thing uh, to do so uh so at the beginning at the very beginning our first experiment we kind of did uh, on the fly uh michael was developing the relationship with this uh, dutch ngo that was working in kenya and was using that as sort of his basis for for some of his work building sort of his infrastructure, but a little bit like his mini infrastructure for his own purposes. And we worked uh, with different NGOs in, uh, in, uh, in India. And then pretty quickly, I realized that uh, there would be a, a lot of gain from uh, building an infrastructure for uh, 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 three reasons, really. One is to avoid repeating the same mistakes. So this is really about, uh, you know, making sure that uh, because we were really developing the practice, not really the science, because the science is, was pretty clear. There are still new things to discover all the time, but the basic concept was pretty, pretty clear. But the, the, the logistics of various things, they, they, we were learning everything and we were making a lot of mistakes. And my first randomized experiment um, the, uh, was had all sorts of problems. First, there was an earthquake, then there was a riot. Then the first test we did, the NGO gave them back to the students before we could enter the data twice. So we had single and three. And then the second test that we did, we had to throw out because all of the students had the same answer because the teacher had copied them on the board. So there were all sorts of things that we were learning. And I thought it's, you know, as long as we've learned them once, like th somehow that learning should uh, be uh, 
<laughs> embedded into uh, institutional memory. That's the first reason. The second reason is that um, uh, it's uh, uh, just uh, forming teams, etc. That is also something. Once you have a team that exists that is good at collecting data and can be reused by someone else, and it's. Uh, we quickly learned that you cannot rely on survey company because they really don't have the same ethics that you do. <laughs> they are not looking for the same things. So we had to build our own things. Once you have to build your own survey infrastructure, then it should again be reused. And the third one is the communication with policymakers. And if you're thinking, you know, why did I choose to spend my time doing that? Or, uh, for me personally, and I think that's very similar for Abhijit and for Michael and for Sandy, is I, I came to economics to, to change the world. That was my goal. Otherwise, I was doing history. I was very happy doing history. It was a nice thing to do, and I would have continued. You know, why do I have to swallow all of this uh, kind of formalism, etc.? It's because it's the day that I realized that you can really make a, a difference into a lot of people's lives. And, and for me, the switch to randomized controlled trials was uh, uh, with the objective of, you know, being maximally useful for policy. And you cannot be maximally useful for policy in your own uh, office. <laughs> you have to make sure that other people can also do it. And it sort of progressed, you know, at the beginning of Poverty Action Lab, it was eight of us. Uh, so it was not massive. And I was myself amazed by what it, the impact that it has to build a pretty lousy website and, and hang your shingle and say, hey, I'm Poverty Action Lab now. Just that, you know, it kind of created its own like dynamics. And uh, and then it sort of grew, you know, by, by itself, uh, thanks to uh, Rachel Glenister, who was our first ED, and then uh, Iqbal Daliwal, they kind of uh, uh, built it and we built it in different regions through the work. And then it sort of, lives its own life. I can also do my own work. Uh, yeah, that's, that's very impressive. So actually, let me turn it over to Guillaume now. Um, but before doing that, let me also tell the audience uh, they should submit questions on the Q&A and we'll, the, hopefully there'll be some time at the end to, uh, for some of the questions uh, from the, the audience. But Guillaume, you want to yeah, take Yeah, thanks, Guido. Um, so, uh, uh, Esther, in the, um, you, you just discussed some of the practical challenges uh, that, that you had implementing um, uh, some of the RCTs, the earlier RCTs that you worked on. Uh, we'd like to explore some of the more theoretical axes along which people have kind of criticized RCTs. And uh, maybe one of the main axes is generalizability. Um, and um, so, to paraphrase uh, Angus Deepen, um, RCTs tend to focus on small interventions that, by definition, only work uh, in certain contexts. Uh, now, you know, this is clearly something that you've, um, you know, that you've thought about. And, um, you know, in, in the, um, your recent 2015 science paper, you studied the impact of uh, a kind of more holistic intervention across multiple countries. And I, I quote from, from the abstract, um, a, a concern is figuring out whether uh, what works in one setting can be made to work in another setting. So this is clearly something that's um, that's on your mind. So we wondered whether you could uh, walk us through, um, you know, how you think about these issues generally and how you'd respond to, uh, you know, people who are worried about generalizability in this context. Yes, that's a great question. So that's, so first of all, generalizability is not just a problem of randomized controlled trial. It's a problem of any observation. So on its own, you know, even though the sun uh, is rising every day on the east, and it could still be the case that tomorrow is going to change. You have to rely on the combination of experience and theory to uh, make a pretty good guess that it's going to be the same thing next time around. And that's really the same with any observational, any observation that you make in the real world, and RCTs are, are no exceptions to that. So let me first address the issue of scale, because I think to some extent, um, Deaton and other, and that, that spells, it, uh, addresses the wrong, uh, or kind of uh, hit the, some wrong straw man, in the sense that uh, although the initial RCTs were quite small, I mentioned the 15, 14 schools in Michael's early experiment, most of the current ones are very big. Uh, so usually now, you know, people work with, uh, um, you know, in units of like 
thousands of tens of thousands or, or hundreds of thousands. Uh, a recent work that I did in a, on immunization in Haryana, for example, has um, 300,000 kids involved in the experiments uh, in all of the places in the districts. Not all experiments have that scale, you still have the small ones, but the idea of the, randomized, the typical randomized controlled trials in economics being uh, 100 kids randomized to something or the other is a little bit uh, uh, inaccurate uh, compared to what people tend to do today. Uh, the second thing is on the scale. It's really, so I think the way I think about general, generalizability is that you don't generalize from any single, at least I don't generalize from any uh, single experiment. And it's that, oh, this is a great program, well, let's generalize it to the entire planet. Uh, but each uh, new experiment is like, uh, you know, a point of color in a pointiest painting. So when you accumulate them, eventually you have something that starts looking like a, a picture of something. And that can be, for example, that by running the same experiment in different uh, uh, places, so for, that's the example of the science paper you talk about, it's the same experiment in different continents. Uh, there is also similar examples on microcredit that has been evaluated in lots of different contexts. Or that can be running uh, um, slightly different program problems, <laughs> programs in the same country where you are slowly, for example, if you're wondering about uh, you know, what, how to improve education, the quality of education, uh, you have uh, uh, programs on textbooks and programs on remedial education and programs on computers and programs on, and each of them you learn something from and eventually it helps you build a theory of what's uh, wrong with the system and therefore what intervention is likely to work next. So you keep having like a back and forth between uh, your theory, which is formalized or not, and then the ex which uh, uh, inform the experimental design, and then the, ex the result from the experiment that inform the theory, which again inform the next experimental design. And in this way, you progress. And there's nothing very different there on experiments relative to, relative to other things. There is just, in a sense, one more step when you really want to move to policy advice, as in not in general, it's important to think about, uh, you know, information, informing households uh, about the benefits of immunization. But when you want to design a particular intervention is the large scale randomized control trial in context, which a lot of people are now doing, where in a sense, before launching at scale, you launch an experiment at scale where you can also try different version of the different programs against each other and or different intensity of the same program and you also by working at scale are dealing with one of the other criticism of experiment which is when you do things very controlled you might get much better result than when they are implemented at policy so i think there is a useful step for the policy experiment which is embracing the, the, the challenges of scale uh, and to me, that's the really only relevant, oh, the most relevant uh, concern about the, when people talk about external validity com that makes an experiment different from something else is the experiment is very well controlled and the real yeah. world is a mess. So it is good to work at scale to let the mess, invite the mess in and see uh, what, uh, what stays. That makes sense. And do, do, do you do you have a sense of why the uh, RCTs are are or or like the, the concern of general generalizability are, are are so much sharper or have been raised in a in in in, in a sharper tone in uh, economics than they have in say uh, drug trials or something like this? Where obviously it is still a concern, but people seem to be less worried or um, less likely to challenge uh, uh, the the importance of, of of drug trials by the FDA say, for approval. I think it's because people, rightly or wrongly, probably mostly rightly, are assuming some more um, permanence of like the biology of the human body. And uh, uh, therefore, if something works on some people, it might work on others. But there are discussions there, for example, there is a lot of uh, concern that uh, uh, there are not enough uh, uh, African-American uh, in uh, randomized control trial in the US. 
or uh, that it's not possible to, that it's very difficult to test, say, a possible vaccine on older people, uh, and that it's not possible to test much things on pregnant women at all. Yeah. Those are very much issues about external validity because you, you need to, uh, but the number of parameters that are free are probably a little bit more, uh, more control in the, really in the drug trial. When you go to the more, you know, larger scale uh, um, efficacy trial over the longer term in when people might or might not comply to a particular treatment, then I think the same type of issues might arise. Okay, that makes sense. Um, okay, I'll, I'll, thanks for, for answering these questions. I'll, I'll turn it over to Dominic. Um, Thanks, thanks, Esther. So the next topic area is about the. I, I believe there's perhaps a little bit of a tension be, between the, the questions that we uh, want to answer. So we might have like a big policy questions that we might to answer, and perhaps the, the the concrete research questions that we can tackle uh, with uh, with RCT. So, for example, in one of your TED talks a couple of years back, you talk about the the big question, for example, that we could ask: Well, did aid in general alleviate poverty? And that is something that is, seems impossible to tackle with a small scale, uh, concrete RCT implementations. So uh, in that topic area, uh, we, have, uh, we have some questions. So the first one here is uh, submitted by someone in the audience. Uh, and this one uh, asks, well, most causal inference designs investigate policies and small scale implementations, what you sometimes call economics as plumbing. However, structural and more old school economic research questions do not, do not seem as adequate for RCTs or natural experiments. Do you think cause inference can also have its role in unveiling mechanisms with longer term horizon, long time horizons and these like uh, these more, yeah, these, uh, these, these, these more difficult questions? Yeah, so I think I addressed the question of scale uh, in the sense that RCTs are often working at scale and often I see the structural papers being written on the same PSID households uh, that have been studied over and over and over again and are not that many. So in a sense, I don't think that there is a much of a difference in the scale. Um, so several answers to that question. So the first one is like, I too would very much uh, find the, the, the answer to the meaning of life. But uh, I haven't like figured out how to get there. So in the meantime, uh, at least in my taste, I prefer to to define questions that are well defined and I can answer. Um, sometimes this is the effect of an intervention, but often through the effect of an intervention is better understanding uh, how people behave, uh, which, for example, are people very responsive to incentives or not very responsive to incentive? Is there strong income effect or not particularly strong? That then people who are more interested in the meaning of life can, you know, can take these pieces and assemble them whichever way they want. Um, so that's that's in in a sense I do think that there is it, it's it's slightly there is space for many people who use very different method in economics, and um, I don't find necessarily mine better than than another one as long as uh, uh, people are serious. Of course, you shouldn't sacrifice uh, rigor for the for ambition. <laughs> you should, even if you go at an, at an ambitious question, you should go about it while being, have your eyes open on what really you can, uh, uh, you can and cannot do. But um, one, I think one value of the RCT uh, movement in economics outside of, uh, its own uh, movement, uh, its, its own life, and I think that's more generally the work uh, of Josh and Hilo and other in the credibility revolution is to force people who do not work with experimental method to uh, precisely model their work on experimental method. So for example, if you're interested in a very long run impact of uh, institution like uh, Daron Asimov does, for example, in my department. So you don't have an experiment to do that, but you can, you know, get as close as possible using the uh, the, the variation that exists in the natural world, and you you encounter some limit. But as long as you are clear about what these limits are, there's really a lot you can learn. 
And then you can also, you know, you also know what you've not learned or where you are taking a leap of faith. And as long as that is transparent, I think there is uh, just enormous amount to learn to learn from this. So I think people uh, choose a little bit both their topic and the way of working depending on their taste. But um, um, there is um, plenty to do from that. that. Then also people combine um, the result of experiments uh, and a non-experimental result to learn more. So uh, for example, the, he does work on surrogates that go from the you know, short run effect to what might be the long, term, long run effect in, is an example of doing that. The use of parameters that are derived from experiment in structural model can also is another way of, 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 of combining. So basically we kind of all are trying to fit various pieces of uh, learning more about how people behave and what this implies for economic system and um, RCT have a role to play, but they are not the, the beginning and, and the end of uh, everything by, by any means. Yeah, great, thanks. Perhaps as a quick follow up questions. Um, um, so like in, in your view, did, do you have some experiments that you would just love to do or that you wanted to do for a long time, but simply because of practicalities, you couldn't implement them yet, or you don't have the resources, or you, you there are some institutional barriers that you, that you have to overcome first? Oh, there are, there are always things that, <laughs> that, I, that I hope that one day I will be able to do. But uh, um, I'm more struck by the number of experiments that I would have never dreamt of doing and someone did anyways. And, and that's really the beauty of ha having started the Poverty Action Lab and ha having seen it grown, uh, is that what, uh, you know, the younger people do is so much better than what we used to do. And to be perfectly honest, it's so much better than I, what I do <laughs> now, uh, because they, they, they push the envelopes in, in ways that uh, um, I, I certainly could not have imagined when we started, and uh, uh, even now get uh, uh, you know, baffled by. To give you just one example, um, 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 ben Olken worked with the tax department in Pakistan to provide incentives to tax collectors for how, uh, uh, for how much tax they, bring, they brought back. And I thought this was like amazing that you could do that. And then and other people replicated the same thing in the DRC, like in, in you know, of all places. <laughs> so people become so much ambitious in terms of uh, the, the, the question they tackle and, uh, uh, and the environment in which they work. So uh, it, keeps, it keeps getting more and more fun. That's a very inspiring story, thanks. Um, I'm now switching over to Michael. Michael. Okay, thank you. So uh, the next question, I guess, is about uh, maybe advice for uh, statisticians or economists who are developing statistical methodology or theory. Uh, and I guess the question is, what are the most uh, important open methodological questions and in, in causal inference in your mind, especially in terms of uh, what would be most useful to practitioners running experiments in development economics or other areas of economics or people working in empirical economics more broadly? So there again, I'm sure that I'm missing uh, some of the key things and, and I'm going to be uh, impressed by <laughs> when it comes. Uh, so let me tell you some of the things that I am trying to work on myself and then some of the things that's open. Uh, uh, so I think we are now uh, working in, with experiments, people are working with uh, very, very large data sets. At least they were before COVID. Now that we are moving to calling people on the phone, we cannot stay on their doorstep asking them, asking them a million questions. Maybe this is something of the past. But in your typical experiment, pre-COVID, you would have this immense baseline and this immense end line with many, many uh, outcomes. Uh, often uh, you have more variables than, um, than people, at least more variable than effectively randomized units. Uh, so you, you see where I'm heading that I think this brings a lot of uh, possibility on uh, combination of machine learning and experiments. That's the work that uh, Hido has done and Sidaniti has done and I have done. 
And Victor Tsiernozokov have done, and many more people, but there is many, much more things to do. So one is, uh, and I, don't, I think we are kind of still fumbling our way around a little bit. Uh, so one, of course, is, um, uh, you know, how to uh, heterogeneity in the treatment effect. Uh, one is uh, uh, which treatment works the best, because in many cases, you, don't have, you have many, many treatments. Uh, so sometimes it's done, you know, it's done in a... Um, it's, the way it's typically done, and I'll go back to this other question, the way it's typically done in your randomized experiment in a developed country is it's one shot. But everything is interacted with everything. So for example, in a recent, the one experiment that I mentioned where we have 200,000 people, uh, we also have 75 unique treatment cells. So that's a lot of treatment. Uh, it's a lot of people too, but it's still too many treatment for the number of people because th they are randomized at lower levels, so there are not so many randomized units. Um, so that's an interesting question of like what works the best. And then the next step would be what works the best for who, which leads to this uh, personalized medicine, which in my opinion is like still fumbling its way around a little bit. It's really a combination of the the, the statistical uh, um, kind of the statistical predictive approach in some sense and uh, the randomization and then that leads us to you know what uh, uh, Hilo talked about econometric society and I think um, it, it, some people are also starting to work on uh, which is the idea of adaptive trials but in uh, in developing countries you need to keep in mind that you cannot it's not like a b testing you cannot change your uh, treatment on the government partner you're working on every two weeks. So what's the, how we are thinking about optimal experimental design in the setup, uh, uh, where it's not going to be possible to quickly uh, reanalyze the data and, and, and reweight your, your treatments. So that's, that's an interesting set of, uh, of um, data set. And then another one, so maybe this reflects just my own ignorance. But I, I really don't like the current state of uh, multiple inference uh, because it seems to me that it's completely, a, a, it's kind of brute force. And it's fine if you had infinite data, but uh, if you go collect each of your data points with your, uh, you know, with uh, sweat and, <laughs> and blood, uh, then it seems to me that there is more to be done that exploits a little bit better uh, what you know about the, or what the data can tell you about the structure of the correlation and between the, the different outcomes you have uh, to do. Uh, uh, so think of it as, uh, think of, so go back to a, uh, a situation where you've collected lots and lots of data and uh, uh, you have lots and lots of possible outcome. If you start doing multiple inference with the usual methods, nothing is <laughs> going to live, even if it should. So clearly that's not right. So on the other hand, running all the regression and picking the five that works, clearly that's not right either. So I think there is something in between, but I don't know what it is. Uh, and maybe one of you already knows and it's my, it's my own ignorance, but if you do, then you should tell us. And if you don't, then I think that's a nice, that's a nice uh, interesting problem potentially. Um, and that relates to something that is really uh, there is a big big pressure in 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 the world of experiment to tie the hands of the researchers uh, with a pre-analysis plan that are very uh, strict so basically you pre-commit in advance to only look at some outcomes and some subgroups so these problems go away uh, which uh, i really am not uh, a, a big fan on because uh, it seems to me that it's throwing a lot of data, but I understand where it's coming from. And so my question is, how do we not let people specification search in a crazy way, but at the same time, uh, take advantage of the fact that we have rich data at our disposal? Something with, because the extreme version of that, which we saw in a debate that really, like I think blew me away in terms of where it was is, going back to this multiple treatment, people recommending that we should not do that we should only run experiment with one or two treatment, which seems to me that, well, if you knew that, knew all that, like why do you even run your experiment? Presumably you know that these treatment are likely to work. If you want to be useful for policy, you have to go in with some, with, with, without pretending to be an oracle. 
So that's that's a kind of a, um, but this is kind of vague in my mind how one navigates this, uh, but uh, quite uh, interesting. Maybe I over elaborated on this answer, but at the same time, maybe that's what you take home to <laughs> think about problems to work on. No, this is this is great actually, kind of telling us, giving us the questions to work on. That's, that's awesome. Yeah, that's the, that's the use of the applied people. <laughs> <laughs> tell you what we don't know, what we would love to know. So, um, Hiro, do you want to ask the next question? I think you're you muted. Want? Sorry, I was, I was uh, muted there. Um, one of the things that has, a, the, one of the other non-experimental non methods that's gained a lot of popularity recently is, is uh, synthetic control. The methods you think that is going to be useful kind of in in development economics you see more uses of those uh, those methods there and see some way of integrating them with with experimental evidence yeah so i think they are they they, they are not used that much in development but it's not only clear uh, to me why uh, because uh, the data is there and, and it seems to be just better than what we do uh, if it's not an experiment. So I think it's going to come. Uh, in part, I think it took a sidestep from economics to move closer to statistics as far as I can tell. And so it needs to come back. So it's, it's going to take some time to, to, to make its way back. But I, it will make its way back and it's going to be used in, in development more. Uh, in particular for this type of long-run questions that um, uh, are, uh, for example, generalizability question, often you've done an experiment and it, then the, the thing was uh, adopted on a larger scale, but not in an experiment, but perhaps in a staggered way, uh, then you could you combine, the, you could use, you, you kind of have a sense of uh, what the effect might be from your experiment. And it's uh, the synthetic control becomes a great method to test whether it's still there uh, when it's done at scale. So that's something that uh, that I, I expect to be developed. I also see the one, uh, uh, another use that I've seen of synthetic, of kind of at least a similar approach is on this, uh, on this example of uh, personalized medicine type of things of people using the approach of synthetic control method to think about uh, what's the what's the best treatment for any particular uh, for any particular group. Uh, so Deva Vrecha recently sent me a paper on that. So that so that's not really synthetic control, but that's the method inspired by synthetic control to this. So that I think is going to be become very interested as people are trying to milk more from one single experiment. Um, so it could be in particular the answer to some of the question I was asking before. Yeah, yeah. You know, you know. yeah. So, so one of the one of the things that you one of the points that you raised when you were talking about JPAD is um, the aspect of engaging with um, uh, policymakers. And um, there, there, there are a few questions that uh, that kind of um, uh, came up in the in the Q and A about uh, 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 relationships, I guess, between uh, economists and policymakers, and um, uh, maybe how to um, uh, uh, bake randomized experiments into uh, the, our general systems for uh, making policy decisions. Um, I, do you have some thoughts on 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 this? I, I can elaborate a little bit on the questions, um, but um, these are kind of the the general lines that were um, approached in the in the questions. Yeah, so let me start and then you can elaborate on the question. So first of all, so the JPAL was always uh, started with these three pillars in, may, in mind, uh, training in methods to run randomized control trial, um, implementing randomized control trial in a good way, providing infrastructure to do that, and then a link to policymaker. So these were always our th uh, three uh, things. And uh, the policy group and the policy uh, work and the policy influence has become more and more important as we as we go along. So we have um, basically a big in every continent we have a deep office and a policy team there, and their job is to be in constant interaction with policymakers, both both to in order to get their questions out, and in order to get some uh, information on the evidence back. 
and uh, um, one of our, you know, the great point of pride has been the various ways in which we've been able to influence policy, which is almost never like I run my small experiment, then I take my PowerPoint slides and I show them to policymakers and boom, they accept uh, the, uh, the work. And it's almost always in this, uh, I mean, it's often, either it's in terms of influencing the debate, for example, uh, Pascaline Dupas' work on bed nets, as uh, you know, which was which showed that people use free bed net just as much as they use it if they have to pay for it, which was replicated a number of times and eventually kind of made its way into the discourse of the the big player in this game, and changed the uh, changed basically policy everywhere. Like, you know, with now with the result that there was massive distribution of free bed net that was responsible for the uh, very big decline in, in malaria uh, cases. So that's one kind of example where it really goes through the, just the evidence and the narrative. But often uh, the, the relationship with the policymaker actually starts before the experiment and they come up with a problem and uh, maybe with some solution they already have in mind. Uh, and then you work with them, we work with them either the policy team or the researchers already work with them to develop an experiment to test their solutions or to test various versions of their solution or to think about how to improve their solution such that the, the randomization becomes like a part of the a part of the policy as we move along so just to continue with this one example the the, the one in Haryana that I mentioned on immunization the reason why we had such a large scale is that we were working directly with the government and they uh, they were interested in working with us because they had put a lot of effort in improving the supply of immunization services. They had camps going very regularly, they thought this was going well, but uh, a lot of people were not going. And so they were open to try uh, any number of things to make people go, but on at scale so that if they, first of all, they would see progress in the course of the experiment itself and second of all whatever worked they could uh, they could uh, run with it and so that's why we tried these various variants we really only had three policies one was sms reminders one was small incentives and one was a program of uh, immunization ambassador for, from from the communities the reason why it multiplies is that we weren't sure what level of incentive we needed and whether we needed to have slope or not. And, and all of these are like the type of plumbing question that, that the, the government needs the answer to in order to settle in on one version. Uh, but we had no guidance from anywhere. So that's why we, we tried these various things. They were all, you know, they were all in, in favor of trying them in isolation, in combination, etc., which in the end gives this uh, uh, give these large trials and we are able, I think, to tell them what's the most cost-effective uh, thing to do. Uh, and uh, and they, they, are, they, are, they would have scaled that up, uh, but for COVID and they will scale that up uh, <laughs> uh, in the next uh, months or so now that the camps are reopening. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Dominic, do you want to take the next question? Thanks. So there is a, <clears throat> yeah, one question is about, uh, so there's some evidence that I think several studies have shown that uh, putting women in charge can have fantastic outcomes. So for example, I think in India, there was this uh, uh, like study or experiment where like some uh, villages were randomly selected and women were put in charge and then the children were better fed and were better educated. So I just wanted to ask whether you can perhaps for us quickly summarize what is the current state of research and perhaps also what policies based on that would be sensible, based on your opinion? Right, so that's an interesting uh, project because it was actually not an actual randomized experiment by me, as in it's not something that we had to convince anybody to do it. It's, uh, in, fact, in fact, in a way, was uh, my second project uh, using randomization. But the randomization came from the, the, the law that the government uh, used to, to uh, allocate uh, set-asides for women. So it was more in the spirit of uh, natural experiment as in uh, Josh uh, Angre's use of the Vietnam draft lottery, which is, there is randomization, but it's there because uh, uh, some, for some other reason. So here people thought that uh, they wanted to have set aside for women because otherwise women uh, do not uh, get elected. And they, um, 
um, but they, they didn't want to let uh, the parties decide where women should be elected because they were worried women would get, you know, only the back of beyond places. So they sort of randomly selected one third of the villages every time was fair. And uh, that's what they did. So that's kind of why, what I exploited. And um, I used that in, uh, in, uh, in a few papers. So the first one was to show that, in fact, women do different things. They actually don't invest more in education, but they invest more in drinking water, infrastructure, um, uh, which is really like the first priority of, of women and in sanitation infrastructure. And then in a second paper, I looked at the effect that it has to have a woman on uh, people's perception of women in politics. So they start with a huge bias against women, both in terms of taste, they don't like to have a woman leader, and because they think women are incompetent. But when they are exposed to a female leader and they realize they are actually perfectly competent, that, that they change their opinion on competencies, and when the seats get unreserved, they vote for them again. And the third thing is to look at the effect of having a female role model in the form of the village leader on aspirations for girls. And we, so we, we measured aspiration for girls uh, um, and we found that people uh, are more willing to have their girls stay in school and stay in school longer uh, if they have a woman as a leader. And in fact, they do, such that even though women don't really invest in education, Kids stay longer in school, girls stay longer in school just to, uh, because of the role model effect. So since then, there has been a, a, a lot of research actually on the impact of women in leadership position using uh, either natural randomization like that or uh, regression discontinuity design, which looks at women who just won versus just lost. And I tended to reproduce this type of finding. So this kind of really has changed my opinion of, uh, of uh, affir affirmative action for women in leadership position. Uh, I was kind of always thinking, you know, let the best compete, whatever, women can go to the top without help. Uh, but now I, I, so really thanks to this research, I've come to realize that there are real barriers for women to succeed. And these barriers become endogenous because if you never see a woman, then you don't think that you can overcome them. And therefore, it's, it might be useful to have these affirmative action measures like set aside for women, like board would in position. And by the way, I think the same would apply for uh, 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 minorities. Um, and I think we, would need, we, we, we do need to be much more aggressive in uh, uh, um, promoting uh, uh, minorities in leadership positions. Uh, because the same thing, there is so much historical discrimination that without one way to start the pump and show people that yes, minority can succeed in the same way that yes, women can succeed, uh, it might never start on its own. Great, thanks. Next question will be asked by Michael. Yeah, um, so this is a question that uh, came from the audience from uh, Adele Dowd, uh, so I'll paraphrase it. Um, and it's about uh, where you think the future of uh, field experiments uh, is going in terms of uh, answering uh, open questions in the science of poverty. So I guess what are, you know, the unanswered questions in the science of poverty that uh, you think are, are uh, important for, for field experiments, experiments to address next. Uh, and the second part of the question, uh, you already addressed a bit, but uh, it's about uh, important open questions in the methodology of experiments and specifically uh, what opportunities, if any, are provided by artificial intelligence? Um, so I think the second part of the question I answered a little bit. It was more I more spoke about machine learning than artificial intelligence, but I think that that might be what was uh, intended by the question. On the um, uh, the first one again, maybe maybe I'm going to punt on this one, uh, saying that you know most of like the great joy of being in uh, in my position is that I keep being uh, amazed by what people come up with. <laughs> and therefore, I don't really need to have a grand plan because it's kind of happening. Um, so I, I think there are a lot of like sort of pressing immediate questions that people really want the answer to. For example, what's the long-term impact of a universal basic income? 
uh, in our universal very basic income uh, in in poor countries, which is something that, in a sense, I have a, we have a recommend that would be a good policy tool in developing countries without having the evidence for it. The people are uh, are working on that. Uh, it's going to take some time to get the long-term answers, but uh, we can get some pointers in between. But that's just a small example of a pressing question and a question that's particularly, um, you know, that's, that's it's an urgent question because of the context of COVID, but uh, uh, many more, there are so many things that's, the, that's also related. The fact that I'm unclear on this question is also related to my approach to things, which is I don't think there is a silver bullet anyways. The world is made of silver pellets. There, is, there are so many things that we need to explore, and they are everywhere. And mo some of these things I've been thinking about, some of I've, I'm, I, couldn't even, I can't even fathom. And then suddenly you get these great findings uh, emerging. And all I'm hoping is to see many more of those accumulating, and the, the pointiest painting is uh, filling up, if you want. So, um... Okay, the next question is also uh, from the audience. Uh, so uh, interference or spillover effects can be a major challenge in development economics. Uh, do you think that current statistical tools are, are sufficient to handle that? Uh, so I think that uh, there is some, I think we are pretty good on the, I mean pretty good, we have, we have made progress on at least some ideas of what should be the right design, experimental design, not only to deal with them, uh, but to deal with spillover effects, but also to measure them, because often we are very interested in them. And in my mind, it requires, um, it requires an experimental, it requires to, 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 to be mindful about them at the experimental stage. Uh, it's all very, very difficult to, to fix ex post. And uh, maybe I'm wrong, but to my mind, we don't have the tools to fix them, to fix them ex post. Uh, but on the other hand, we, you know, many more, I've seen now, you know, many things uh, uh, coming to me where the experimental design was uh, uh, done in, you know, say, for example, you randomize f at, at two levels or at three levels in order to capture spillovers both within village and across village that are near each other. Or, so, so that's one design that where you really are trying to get at the equilibrium effect. Um, I, I wrote one of the one of those papers some time ago. It was on France. We were interested in uh, um, equilibrium effect on the labor market of uh, of an intervention that helps some people and not some others. And we randomized basically all of friends uh, because we were randomizing at the labor market level. And at the time I thought this was quite, you know, impressive even if I say so myself, but now I see people doing like, like all the time. <laughs> so this is, uh, so we are, we are making progress on that. I am sure we'll find, you know, other, uh, other ways to, you know, re refinement on this and thinking about why this is uh, in fact all wrong and we can do much better. But uh, um, I, I think this will continue to require design. Thank you. I think William's going to ask the last question. Yeah, so uh, yeah, in the interest of time, maybe it's time to uh, 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 wrap up. So the last question uh, is, you know, probably sounds a little cliche because it's probably asked all the time as a last question, but um, it, it did come up in the Q&A and I'm sure some people are interested in, um, is um, what kind of advice do you have for um, young, say, development economists or people who are interested, say, in development in general? Maybe uh, maybe the best track for them is not necessarily economics, but what what what, what would you say to people who are interested in, in, in having an impact on that front and uh, the possible next steps, possible directions? So I must say I have been pretty happy with economics in terms of having an influence on the world. I think it's a very good position to be uh, to be in. Uh, uh, this might, you know, this might change, and statistics might become also a field that has a more direct, uh, um, um, a way of having a more direct link <laughs> link to what is happening in the real world. Um, but uh, in the meantime, economics is kind of ideally placed in the sense that you can uh, 
spend all the time you want in getting the right answer but when you do have the right answer it's quite easy to find someone's ear to uh, to whisper it into so I would say that if your objective is to um, you know ev eventually be pretty close to have an influence on on the world then uh, it it makes sense to it makes sense to do economics it also has the uh, to study economics it also has the the virtue of giving you uh, kind of the, the culture, the exposure of the various aspects of uh, uh, the economic lives of the poor. So by studying, for example, economics at the graduate school level, you learn behavioral economics and therefore are exposed to a bit of, of, uh, of a psychology. You learn uh, econometrics, of course, and then you, if you want to go deep into that, you can learn the statistical tool that you will need. Uh, you are you're exposed to people like me who are on the field and can uh, help you know can help and structure your experiment but um, so that's it's kind of a good good place to be but the reality is that there is any uh, <laughs> there is any number of ways to get where you want to, where you want to where you want to be and the, what I'm just going to say is going to sound very trite but uh, if you study something and know it very well, then you will find a way to make it useful. Makes a lot of sense for sure. Um, Guido, uh, do you want yeah, to wrap up? Yeah, let me let me just uh, thank uh, thank you, Esther, for taking the time to uh, answer all these questions. Uh, this was this was really interesting. Uh, I think uh, a lot of people really appreciate uh, you doing that, and keep up the the good work. I'm very excited to have done it and, uh, you know, feel, uh, feel free to, to be in touch if you have, you know, particular questions. Uh, yeah, I, I think your, your comments kind of about the way you see experiments as just building evidence and but weaving that together in some big uh, tapestry. I think, I think that's actually a really nice metaphor for, for the, the way we should think about uh, experiments in, in lots of places. Uh, in some sense, I think that's true both in, in economics as well as the way you see experimentation used in some of the, the tech companies, uh, where it's really much more of a process than a one-off uh, thing. Exactly, and it sort of builds on each other. Yeah, this was super inspiring. I think this was great. Thank, thanks so much for, for being the first to do this. Uh, that's yes, good. I don't need to be compared to the greater. <laughs> <laughs> no, you set the standard here. Thanks. Uh, Thanks. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.